Great. Um, so it's good to see everybody again. I'm going to share my screen. These slides are on Canvas, so um, so you can see them there. And you are screen sharing. Okay, good. Let me open up a chat. This is the trying to open up chat windows and have windows everywhere. Okay, so I usually don't go into presentation mode on PowerPoint just because then it blacks out my whole screen and I can't see the chat window and things. So I've shrunk the tiny little slides on the left um, and I'll put it back at the beginning. So there we go. Um, some of you will have seen some of these things before. Um, the, there's a big concept component to what we're about in this class and some of the goal of today's presentation. Can you see my slides? That's the first question I should, okay. Yes. Yeah. Sure. I don't want you to see the rest of my desktop. because it's a mess. No, we just see that. Just see okay, that. Perfect. Oh, so it looks like I'm organized and, and have my act together. All right. Um, so questions, data, maybe answers. Those of you who have taken classes from me before will, will recognize that I, I will have the whirling vortex of analysis coming up but I, I need to drill that into your minds. So I'll have it in twice today and at least twice every other time you see. It's my modal slide, but I, I, you'll have to wait to see where it shows up, although you can probably spot it on slide four there. So, so what are we gonna talk about today? One of the things I think Yap did great, great overview is this class is not just Yap and I taking our brains and pouring it into your, you know, knowledge into your brains. Um, these are ideas that underlie a lot of ecology, disease ecology studies that we hope will play out, you know, in your, yeah, the whirling vortex is critical. So um, it's, it, hypotheses come from somewhere. So where do they come from? And then how do we assess whether a hypothesis works? The scientific method is a good ideal, but as we move through, some of the things we're, are not gonna be under our control. We won't be running a whole experiment but we'll be grabbing data from other locations. So it's the courses on data and ideas and research and questions, but that also means there's a lot of discussion. We need to, as you're absorbing the ideas we're talking about, um, you're gonna have ideas of your own that will feed back to us and to your colleagues and your faculty members. So our next, um, so it's how do we learn things? We, we're indoctrinated into the scientific method that you know, we want to have pursuit. a hypothesis, we want to assess data to see how it fits, and then we adjust our hypotheses. That's kind of our cycle. But these are the four steps I think of. There's a question that we want to answer. There's data we would need to answer that question. And if we're designing an experiment, we try to use that information to go gather our data. But in a lot of settings, especially the data science, big data era, there's other data we can get from repositories or other studies or, or um, other things. And then we have methods to combine these and understand them. And then we do answer some questions. Um, we answer the questions with the data we can get and methods we use, and then we'll loop back. So that's where the picture comes from. Um, they have the, this is a cycle, not just a bulleted list. So this is for the visual learners. The one for before was for people who like lists. Um, there's a question we want to answer. And hypothetically, we could think of the perfect data we would need to answer that question, but we probably can't get exactly that. So there's the data we're able to get. And then there's the questions we're able to answer from that data. And then we try to see how close the box with the questions we answered is to the box where we want to answer. We want to bring that together. And we typically go around and around. You're never really done because there's always more data you could get. You could always refine this. You may reject part of your hypothesis uh, in favor of something else. And um, we cycle around. And every one of these steps to tie it to this class and this program happens at a different scale. There's scales of observation. There's the scale at which the process really operates. There's um, the scale at which our methods work. And this, so you could, if you have the scale of the question you want to answer or scales with an S, then you have the scale of the data you would need. There's a component of this cycle where by choosing a certain data set, you've limited which scales you're looking at and you may miss part of the picture. So that YAPS um, figure last time with some of the um, offensive and defensive approaches to intervening was really important. And we have some more examples to think of today. So when I say scale, you've already had Yop's introduction, but um, use the chat box. What, what are some things you think of with scale? 
it, it can be just generally, what do we mean by scale in ecology? What do we mean by scale of observation or scale of a process? The level of organization, that's a good summary. I like that. Uh, at, you know, it's at where do things happen? What are some other thoughts on this? Time scales, yeah. Do you watch it for years? Do you watch it for minutes? Do you watch it for nanoseconds? Spatial scales, yes, that's near to my heart. So, you know, do you look at it at a national level, at a regional level, state, down to your neighborhood, inside your house? Um, Dave, could you elaborate on grain a bit? Is it like how grainy the image is, or is it grain to eat? I'm, I didn't uh, even Yeah, know. yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, there's the scale at which, you know, there's extent in grain, I think. So, so how coarsely or how finely resolved the data may be. Yeah, so that level of aggregation is uh, similar to, well, it's a component of the scale of observation. What, what are you measuring? And then there's, if, if that scale doesn't line up with the scale at which things really happen, you can miss the story. So I'll, I'll do some specific examples of that in a bit. Uh, the size, the sample study um, of a sample or study size, those are all important. You know, what can you observe? We do sample size calculations because we want to have a high probability of detecting a given effect. Um, so scale plays into all of these pieces and there's multiple scales. And this is the point I was sort of mess mentioning here is there's a scale at which the phenomenon we're interested in happens. There's a scale at which COVID is transmitted. There's a scale at which that's observed. I see whether you are infected or not. I see whether you have symptoms or not. I see whether you have a test or not. Um, and then there's a scale at which it's controlled or adjusted. So, you know, person to person transmission is one scale. Trying to define whether a school should open or not is based on the idea of the individual scale, but it's implemented in an aggregate scale. So what are the effect? And they're not, I'll answer the last rhetorical question. They're not the same, um, but they're all important. And they also can influence, uh, influence the level of learning that happens in our, from our research. So we think about the scales of infectious disease and here's a, a list that you know is naturally going to be incomplete, but there's the scale of the host and the host movement. So as we move around, so Dave's moving in his office, but not moving, moving. He's he's moving there. Um, there's the scale of the pathogen. There's the scale of any vectors that are involved and whether the vectors move. So if you think of uh, mosquito-borne illness, um, different species have different feeding patterns, different movement patterns that can play a different role in how things play out. There's the scale of the environment and its impact on other scales. So uh, climate change or even local weather patterns can play into how a vector moves, whether the host goes outside, whether I go outside and walk through a forest that has ticks with Lyme disease. So the scale of environment and its impact on other scales the scale of the contact that's required for transmission. Is it groups of people getting together? Is it shaking hands with somebody, which we never do anymore? Um, and then in parentheses, I've got the scale of observation and control. It, those also play into different parts of the transmission cycle and the infection cycle and the pathogen life cycle and the host interaction with the pathogens. So one example is, is flu. We, we talk about influenza each year on a global scale. We talk about it on a national scale, on a state scale. You see uh, the CDC maps where the states are, you know, is it high intensity, low intensity transmission? You can see it at the county scale. You can see it at a city scale, neighborhood scale, school scale, classroom scale, hand and nose scale. So these were a scale, these are the examples that were very relevant last year when I presented this in January. Um, there's also the time scales that were mentioned in the chat box. You know, what happens each year? Which vaccine, what's the vaccine mix we should use? Um, the seasonal scale, we talk about um, the flu season. If you remember H1N1 had a different scale, a different temporal scale. It wasn't as strongly seasonal. So we had cases into the summer. Uh, the monthly scale, weekly scale, daily scale. But COVID-19 sort of is, you know, front and center on everyone's mind, whether you're researching this or not. We, I have the same list of scales here I had for flu. 
but we've sort of seen uh, them take on a different importance on a novel pandemic setting that we did for flu, which was happening every year. And we wanted to know how it was a little different. We knew it operated at these different scales, but you can see a lot of the discussion on COVID going at the global scale. So we've got the WHO team in China right now, national scale and some of the nationalism on uh, uh, vaccine uh, prevention, assessing treatments, uh, the state scale, county scale, if you look at the New York Times or Hopkins database and you look at your neighborhood, um, what's going on here, where are things going up, where are things going down, city scale, your neighborhood scale, home scale, you can also think of your social network scale, do you have friends or relatives who are impacted by this or friends or relatives with wildly different opinions. Um, it, can age be considered I have it behind the pictures, a scale. No, that's not too specific. And in fact, it's important to think of age and time as two different things. Um, so in epidemiology, people often talk about age period cohort models. So there's the cohort, if you're people of a similar age have some shared interest and shared behaviors. Um, and so that's not so much that being 18 means that you have a different susceptibility, but that being 18 means you have a different set of exposures and behaviors and propensities that reflect, that'll impact your risk. So age puts you in a cohort. Um, there are biological things that happen as we age. So those of us in our 50s have discovered we can hurt ourselves while we're sleeping. Um, that was a big breakthrough um, mentally and physically for me. Um, so that there's things that have, you know, that people of a certain age kind of phrase is there are things that happen to you because biologically you're that age, but there's also things that happen to you because you're in that age group and the period of, of history you've lived through up to this point. So I have some experiences growing up um, from, you know, what was considered safe or, you know, what was considered healthy or what those things change somewhat over time, but they've influenced my experience at my age. Um, in addition to my, my biology. Um, and then the, the, so age period cohort, the period is like what period of time you're going through. Are there, all of you are living through a pandemic right now and you're living through that pandemic at a certain age. That age plays a role in COVID-19 risk and also risk of severe outcomes. So I, I have a different perspective at my age than my parents do and that you do we all have uh, to do this risk calculus on our own and that happens at a scale. So scale can be something on an axis like time or on a plane like space, but it can also be in terms of grouping. Like we organize people uh, sort of like clustering um, phenotypes or something like that. Um, so I think scale in the broadest sense is grouping of something or grouping or dividing and how far do you group and divide. So I would, I would include age in that, but I think that's a really interesting question to put in there. Um, you could also discuss this in terms of social determinants of disease like income or race, ethnicity, and those different combinations. Just like I was saying with age period cohort, there's direct effects of that and there's indirect effect of those combinations too. So I think that's a, a really good point. Which, which groups do you put together? And, and why are you putting them together? So that can happen at the kind of population scale, but you could also think of it um, at, at any of these as we get smaller and smaller. So COVID-19, we can further subdivide this down into some of the within host or even within cell um, type features too. There's a scale of the individual. There's my behavioral aspects, but also the physically, what am I exposed to? There's the immunologic scale, what happens if I get infected versus you getting infected. There's the virus scale and how the virus is behaving. And then there's the proteins and the binding and then the genomics and that you can keep going. All of these are relevant to COVID-19, but I think one of the points we brought up last week is all of us have expertise in some of these scales and none of us have expertise in all of these scales. And the other thing I liked about Yop's figure with the offensive and defensive, that as we learn things about a particular disease like COVID at different scales, what does that, what does that tell us about what we can do for it? So we have, um, so the scale of response, what are some ideas there? 
Um, you can put those in the chat. You think about personal protective equipment, that's not really at the immunological level, but a vaccine is at the immunological level. So thoughts on scale of response. And, and response doesn't have to be a formal government response while it can be also just, yeah, so like border closures, some of the travel restrictions we saw recently with the, um, the UK strains. Mask wearing is a scale of response and an individual choice that has an impact. Um, so I think like mask and personal protective equipment, these things are happening at a societal level that aren't directly impacting the virus itself. They're trying to break the chain of interactions. Um, my, so one of the, in your bubbles, your school closures, business changes, working at home, um, indirect versus direct protection types of control. These are all, pro, this may not be totally fair, but I think a lot of focus on responding to infectious disease has always been medical treatment of the individual who's already infected. Um, prevention is a harder thing to do, but it also gets into behaviors that aren't directly related to the, the, um, the transmission, but can impact likelihood of transmission. So that social distancing was not something we saw during the flu season all the time. We just heard, wash your hands, you know, be careful. We'd still go to work, we'd still go to school, and we all had a chance of getting sick. Uh, we would, you know, choose to take the vaccination, and that might reduce it, but we didn't do the large scale social distancing that we saw last year. And if, when I see these graphs of flattening the curve and then it goes up at 4th of July, then it goes up now, there's this tendency in the policy side to, to open things up again as soon as it turns down. But I, I sort of feel like the level it gets to is defined by how much interaction we have. So if we have more interaction, that curve's gonna go up higher. And if we open things up, we're getting these kind of hiccups up and up and up and down. And maybe to, to add one thing, uh, maybe building on what KM said in the chat, but, but I think it's really interesting thing about skills right now with the vaccination in COVID, right? But we know from the studies is that vaccination is protective, certain level of protective um, against disease, against hospitalization. But what we don't know yet is how effective it is against preventing transmission, right? So that's the, the perfect example where you get vaccinated, it protects you, but you should still do social distances. You should still use masks because we simply don't know yet if it also reduces transmission. So then you really think about a population level impact as well. I think that's an excellent point. There's also the sort of social messaging of you stop wearing a mask and people say, why aren't you wearing a mask? And you say, I got vaccinated. It, we, we, we don't have a large level of societal trust of, of people. We've had people saying they didn't want to ma wear masks for other reasons. And so keeping the mask on, in a sense, is a, a message or a scale of continuity saying, I'm still part of this with you. Um, in addition to the transmission questions that are, I, there was a report today about one of them helping with trans transmission, but those are much smaller scales than the phase three studies of actual symptomatic outcome. So Izzy has a nice point here too on the national scale about data centralization and publication. We've had this sort of every state on their own view, which has made it very hard to coordinate data. Um, and that scale, of, if, the, if it's harder work to put it together, that's gonna limit the scale of analyses that are done. So we, we don't feel as good about the national level data because it's got these holes in it and different places are doing that. Scales of involving social and cultural determinants of transmission and response are really important um, in terms of the, uh, the messaging. And we've seen a lot of reports about messaging to various communities on vaccination as well. And come some of the feedback on that um, having, so, there's the scale of social media information as well, I think could be a whole nother point of topic. So it, these are really good um, points on here. Yeah, the things about interspecies spread, there was a write up about elimination and eradication components in the, um, from one of the news sources today. And you know, can you eliminate something that can be maintained in a, a animal reservoir or, or exists in the environment if you think about the chronic wasting and prions and so on. So the uncritical use of huge databases was also a big problem early on. 
uh, Dave. We can also talk about the scale of scientific publication. You know, I know I'm going all over the place, but scale of scientific publication, the time scale of preprints and archive is sort of a nice place to park things so people could look at it early. But now we'll see whole whole publications living and dying before the peer review process peer review process is complete. Is that something that's going to go away with less urgency, or is that the world we live in? Um, there's a lot of self-publishing sites. There's some really good medium articles, and there's some, you know, not so helpful ones. There's social media posts that get liked and forwarded. Um, so the echo chambers is a, a very real thing, and we've seen a lot of things that are challenging to our research. Sometimes as scientists, we think we're above all this, but um, I think some of the some of the use of preprints and so on has also illustrated that, that we're human beings after all. So I think we need to keep all, this is, thanks for putting all the chat ideas here. We'll have some more opportunities for these as well. One of the other examples I did last year was measles. So measles is an, an older one with vaccination being around for a while, but it's also moved into the uh, we don't have enough vaccination coverage to prevent localized outbreaks from spreading. So there was the scale at which this infectious disease operated prior to vaccination. And Otar Bjornstrad and Brian Grenfell have a whole series of papers really interesting looking back at the UK's uh, spatial connectivity prior to vaccination, after vaccination, and localized outbreaks. And then we have the scale near full vaccination. And we have scale during not as full as it used to be, but still pretty full. Um, it's a very interesting setup and, you know, a lot of lessons to learn for COVID, I think, as well. Um, we tended to think that if once the vaccine was available, that would be the end of the story, but it, it's going to be a component of the response and we'll have to determine how successful it is. So I think these ideas of vaccination rollout over the course of this year and then monitoring coverage and local coverage over time is going to remain with us. It's not, not something that's just going to vanish um, if past vaccination uptake is any indicator. Um, the scale at Disneyland and scale not at Disneyland is not just a whimsical um, bullet line of mine. You remember there was an outbreak based at Disneyland a year and a half ago. And then there were people who had contact with those individuals and trying to track that. Um, so the localized outbreaks of measles or uh, meningitis we see on college campuses and so on, um, those are all aspects of small scale outbreaks that are, that are important, um, but very different from the pandemic setting. So if we go back further to cholera, so in 1854, the cholera outbreak in London, this is the Jon Snow outbreak, not the Game of Thrones Jon Snow, but the, the old one, um, John with an H. So this is, the, so the exposome is uh, an environmental health phrase of, it's like your genome, but it's all your exposures. So it's everything you've ever been exposed to all your life, all the food you eat and all the, all the air you breathe, all the water you drink. So that has different scales. You may have, uh, acute scale, short-term effects of water you drank yesterday, or you may have a long-term accumulation of, um, of exposure to air pollutants or something like that. You can think about asthma uh, the, a couple of days after a spike in air pollution, but you could also think about your long-term respiratory health. Well, this is a graph from 1854 put together for the London Board of Health when they were looking at the um, cholera outbreak. So the big, big epidemic curve that you see in the middle is uh, both diarrheal cases and cholera. So it spikes up and goes up. And everything in the background are things like temperature, relative humidity, rainfall. They're trying to find the magic bullet, a combination of which, which combination of values triggered this to go up. So this is, uh, this is, you know, over 150 years ago, but we're still doing the same kind of thing with some of the big data and machine learning. Let's look at all of these data streams and figure out how they come together to predict this. And they may happen at different scales. There may be different time lags. So it's a challenging problem. So that's the time series aspect. The, 
The spatial one is John Snow on the right looking at the map of cholera deaths and looking at the Broad Street pump and going, aha. So this is actually an animated slide where his eyes pop open. And I spent a lot of time making that one. So I use this almost as much as the whirling vortex. Um, so this is, you know, the, the health GIS people I hang out with. We always talk about John Snow because um, he made a map and, and took the handle off or requested they take the handle off the public water pump and it ends the um, outbreak. If we go back in time, by the time the committee meetings ended to get the water pump off, they were kind of well past the peak. Um, so Snow's work is really brilliant. And if you read it, it's very modern sounding um, or modern ideas of, I have data, I don't quite know what they mean, but if I summarize them this way, it gives me a little more insight. Um, so this, we've been doing disease ecology scale things for, for quite some time. I have covered this up on my slide. So does identifying the scale always lead to the correct conclusion that we have some things to learn from snow as well. When the London Board of Health looked at the maps and, and there were also people who made maps based on the miasma theory that there was bad air involved. Um, they, there was a several hundred year old plague mass grave that they were afraid the new storm sewers had, had tunneled into and the air from the plague bodies was coming out through the drain holes, the gully holes and that um, people who were breathing it were getting cholera and dying because it, it would happen in the summertime. It would be more common in poor sections of London. It smelled really bad. So you could just smell that the air was so bad um, people would get it. So Snow made his map. The London Board of Health made some maps. They all look the same because they're using the same data of the deaths. And um, you'd think with Snow's map, and you can see you know, on the look on his face back here, he's it's just brilliant. He notices that it's all concentrated here. But if you think about where the drain holes are, if you're building a storm sewer and you have public water pumps, you usually put a drain right next to the pump in case it leaks. So it's essentially the same map, except instead of little X's for the pumps, they have the drain holes marked by it. So it's going to cluster in the same area. And Parks wrote in 1855, um, looking at this, he said, well, it certainly looks more like the effect of an atmospheric cause than any other, because if it was owing to the water, why wouldn't the cholera have shown up everywhere people drink water? Um, so they were both looking at the same data. They're looking at a similar map, and they came to completely different conclusions on whether it's localized due to the water or if it's due to the air. So Snow's success was not only due to his map. That wasn't his one, one highlight. This, the map's amazing. Um, but a lot of his work was also looking at which houses got water from which water company. And one of them pulled water upstream from the Thames and the other downstream. One had a lot more sewage in it and that had much higher, those neighborhoods had much higher counts. So the, the map only wasn't, we, we sort of present it like it's so obvious that Snow was right, that it changed, you know, introduced the germ theory and all this stuff would go on. But there was still a lot of old guard um, so there's a scale of acceptance of the idea, too. And you can even go back further time. This is in um, New York City in 1798. A gentleman named Valentine Seaman um, noticed there was a concentration of yellow fever cases, or, and there were a lot of mosquitoes there as well. But his conclusion is that the, the bad air, the miasmata, was so bad it even generated mosquitoes. So he would see disease and mosquitoes together, but the idea that diseases could be transmitted in a way other than breathing the air was, um, was, was just not in his scope. And so it's quaint for us to look back and say, oh, I can't believe they believed that. But there's a lot of things we're trained to think as well. Um, and some of those are gonna prove to be incorrect. So even if the scales align, we carry our own expectations and assumptions that cloud our understanding. So are we just seeing what we want to see? Well, it's a question we kind of have to ask ourselves all the time. And scales can change what we see. That you've seen examples of people sort of massaging their data and the display to tell you a story, but aggregation also changes what happens. If you think about COVID tests and you get the false positive sensitivity and specificity, that means something for you as a patient, like should I, do I, should I worry that I got a positive test? But it's also what fraction of the tests are positive at the population level. Those, they're using the same measurements in aggregate, sometimes ask us to do some different things. 
So the aggregation, you know, for people in ecology, nobody likes the phrase ecologic fallacy that the epidemiologists say all the time. But uh, the idea that the associations between two variables at an aggregate level may be different than what happens at the individual level um, is, is a real concern. What we see on average across people um, might not be what, the, what happens to a single person. Um, one way to think of this, this is the geographic version of the ecologic fallacy, which is called the modifiable aerial unit problem. So if these dots here are the actual cases of disease, and then I have a couple of scales of aggregation, I have the squares that I shade, or rectangles, sorry, that I shaded in in the background, so they're darker if there's more dots there. And then I have the polygons that collect those. So this, um, let's take the one in the top left, has a collection of three cases in the upper left corner. But once I take the, I've only got, I've got four cases across the sort of upside down L shape. Um, so that looks like a low rate, even though one of the neighborhoods inside it is high. The concentration I see in the middle is split among some of the other aggregations so that the darkest corner, I don't have anything that dark in my aggregate value. So I could miss that. The map on the right maybe is, doesn't look as clustered as the map on the, on the left. And if I knew where the actual individuals were, I might be more concerned. So ha just having data doesn't necessarily mean you have data at the scale you wish to see. So we see individual level with the dots. We see local neighborhoods in the, the red bordered rectangles. And then we see the dark um, boundary polygons, which tend to wash out the aggregation we see in the middle. Um, this is a figure I use a lot too. You might think, I tend to think of these as filters we're passing through. So if we start on the left and each one of these is a map. So I have a map of the host distribution. Where do the people live? Where do they go? I have a map of vector distribution over the same space. I just kind of split it out there. Where are the mosquitoes or where are the ticks? And then I have pathogen distribution. Which of those mosquitoes or ticks are currently infected? That could vary across space. Um, and then I have the landscape and climate that goes on there and that has in, that influences where the vectors go, whether they get infected, where do the hosts go, all of those dynamically interact to give me my marquee map in the middle with the dots around it of where the true cases are in the hosts. Um, so these hosts could be people, they could be animals, uh, they could be plants, we could say what's the map of who's infected right now. Um, I might, I never ever get to see that map, although I want to I want to understand it. That's where I want to learn. So if uh, cases that are really happening first have to be diagnosed, so we have to see if they're happening. And that would give us the next map over to the right. It's like a diagnosis filter. And that might be a map itself. Maybe there's more, more, pe more people go in for di to get diagnosed in the northern half than in the southern half. Or different parts of the world, we may have people um, going in for COVID tests, for instance. So now we have a map of diagnosed cases, and then those have to get in the data set. So there's a reporting filter. Maybe some uh, testing sites are really good about entering their data right away, and some of them don't enter their data. They send it to the individual, but it doesn't get to the health department. So we've got surveillance, data surveillance over on the right, and we've got modeling the disease ecology on the left. Uh, you could extend this on the left further down to the dynamics of the, of the pathogen itself um, and medical response and so on, immunological response in the hosts. How does that vary from different locations and times? So you've got this whole continuum from ecology to public health. I tend to start on the right-hand side of this figure and try to back things out coming from public health. Um, the mathematical modelers tend to start on the left-hand side and try to model the dynamic interactions between these different patterns and to meet in the middle. So this is another way of thinking of scales um, and impact of our observation process. How do we see the data that we see? Um, we're not measuring every single person, but we're getting some measurements of people who come in to get tested and their results. So this, that diagram can be summarized in words is there's scales of hosts, there's scales of parasites, there's, there may be coevolution between these things. Um, we can change scale with different control measures. It might be the, 
the point we were making earlier about COVID that the height of the epidemic curve depends on the level of uh, interpersonal interaction that's going on. You can think about if we stop that, that was the whole point of flattening the curve. And we flattened it at the beginning and then we let it go and it got higher and um, flattened it with some uh, reactions to that and then, or not reactions as we see with holiday travel and so on. So we've seen some examples of scale and data and historical ones, you know, ones we're living with now, ones that we were living with um, over 100 years ago. We want to hook um, disease and ecology together. Now, scale is a big issue in ecology and always has been sort of a central idea. Um, in 1989, so in the olden days, <laughs> Simon Levin, who does a lot of mathematical biology, he gave a, an invited lecture, the Robert MacArthur Award Lecture. So you're, it's like looking back on your career, let me talk about whatever I want to talk about. And usually it's about big ideas. So he, he spoke about the, the issue of scale and ecology. And even though this is a quite old paper, um, there's some really nice, these award lectures, if when they're done really well, can connect a lot of dots, just like a really good review can do. Um, so he published an article in Ecology in 1992. And as of last year, it had about 4,000 citations and it has more. And this is the one that um, we've posted on Canvas and, and some of you've read um, and some of you are, are about to read it. Um, I think it's a good place to start. Some of it'll sound really dated. Um, you think about the kind of things that we've developed in terms of molecular measures since 1989. Um, but the, the concepts I think are good ones to float in here. And I'm gonna highlight some ideas that um, come out of this. And these are just from the abstract. So this is not that I didn't have enough time to read the paper, but the abstract is so rich in ideas that you want to read the rest of the paper. So let's take a look at some of these and I'll be pausing for some input from you. And the bold face is things I, I bolded. So um, in the problem of pattern and scale is the central problem in ecology, unifies population biology, ecosystem science, marries basic and applied ecology. Um, so it's not that scale is an issue we have to work around. He's saying it is the issue. It's a component of this. And the patterns we see happen at a scale, the patterns of the process happen at a scale. And those may not line up. The second comment, the applied challenges such as the prediction of the ecological consequences in, of climate change, for instance, require interfacing of phenomena that occur on different scales of space, time, and ecological organization. So the interfacing of phenomena that occur at very different scales, thoughts about that? We sometimes talk about scale, trying to find the right scale as if there is one. And this is saying that things happen that we're studying because things happen at different scales and the, the way they happen at different scales can play into what we see. It can play into what happens and it can play into what we see. And the ecologic fallacy kind of says that those, what, what we see might not be what's happening if we're measuring at the wrong scale. And then comment three is the blows your mind. There is no sing natural scale at which things can be studied because they show characteristic variability at a range of scales. So sometimes we try to, you know, reductionist science tries to break things down to the simple thing where just this happens. But what happens in ecology is a combination of things going on. Um, so it's a challenging science because it's both experimental and observational at the same time. And it's almost impossible to get down to the just one thing. And uh, Linda points out that uh, we're observing some phenomenon, but at what scale is it happening? How many things are happening at the same time? And emerging patterns can be useful to limit scale. So Sebastian, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, 
when things change is oftentimes when we can detect something different. And a lot of science advances from saying, oh, that's funny, as opposed to Eureka. Um, we first have to identify a pattern, build a hypothesis, and then try to think of ways to test it. And climate change causes are geographically separated from high risk areas. So sometimes things change in one place, but not another. And they would be related if they happened together. So this, this perfect storm phrase we use a lot of times, when things line up, um, there can, it's not always additive. It can, it can grow quite quickly. Uh, once you have a question, you've likely constrained yourself on the scale you can observe. That is correct, um, but that's, I think one of the points of this uh, scale paper and then what we're talking about today is that yes, no scale exists, but it's not futile. It doesn't mean you should stop looking for them. Um, it's just a context within you should understand. So once you've pinned down your question, and one of the reasons I like to have a cycle is that that question is gonna answer that question at that scale. And then the next question you can ask is, does it hold at other scales? Um, do I need to measure it at other places? So you can observe data at different scales. You can have a hypothesis at which things happen. And so, Linda, do you wanna say a little more about your experience or what you're referring to here? Oh boy, I mean, I guess it's obvious that I'm thinking about my research. Um, if I'm observing like population levels of, you know, either parasites or like a certain amount of animal populations. I can think about those populations on individual scales and how their physiology is playing into their, you know, individual little bodies, basically. And then there's scales of chemistry and all that other stuff below it. So those are all different scales that I can technically observe. Um, and while, you know, you make the original observation at a population scale, because that is what is often like easy or useful for people to observe in our daily lives. Um, you can observe things at different scales. You just have to have a good hypothesis or you know theory connecting how these different scales actually interact in order to make predictions across them. Thanks. Um, th that's that's exactly what I was looking for. Thanks. The. Uh, I think a thing to think of scales can be filters of what we see, but also scales are a context for any work you do. They define your, your question has to have a scale associated with it. Too often it's implicit, but I hope one of the things that comes out of this class is, is making it explicit. Um, Yop's figure from their paper showed that there are different questions of interest at different scales. The COVID discussion we're having here shows that there's different um, questions of interest at different scales. When you define your question and design your study, it's in the context of a certain scale and you want to present your results that way too. That way, when somebody says, I saw clustering at the, at, you know, I saw clustering of these two things and I, someone else says, I didn't see them. It's entirely possible they're both right. It was just happening at a scale that lined up with the first study and not with the second study. So having the context be defined is an important part of reproducibility of work as well. If you do an experiment and someone's trying to replicate that experiment um, or extend it, they're going to have to know what you were um, thinking in the scales you had in mind. Maybe to add to that, Lance, it's kind of what we said last week, right? But one thing that we hope that people get from this, this course and the seminar series is to really, even if you don't study things at different scales, to think about those other scales, right? And what we mentioned last week is you, you can do a study at a particular scale but you can think about how may my study have impacts on the studies at different scales, right? And that may change in some cases, the kind of variables you want to measure. Like we said last week, you know, are you looking at the individual, actually what we just said about the COVID vaccines, are we interested just in the health impacts of that vaccination for the individual? Or do we also want to know what the transmissibility of that virus is given that vaccination, right? So you can measure both of those things, or you can think about, we don't just measure health impacts, see whether that individual turned up in the hospital, but also find out what were the viral titers of that individual, right? And then feed into the next skill. And that could, we used to hypothetically discuss this, but you know, it's now a real 
issue. Suppose you had a virus or a vaccine that wasn't particularly good for you, but if you got infected, it would make you much less, less likely to transmit it to somebody else. Um, in terms of making money on a vaccine, that probably doesn't lead, lend itself to wide scale use um, because you're actually getting the vaccine for other people and not so much for yourself. Um, but it's an interesting ethical question of should we develop those kind of treat? If we developed a treatment like that, should we market it and encourage it at the same level? Um, it would it would impact the uh, yeah. It is like the original messaging around masks. When people talked about uh, whether it was good for you know it wasn't really going to help you, but it could help other people uh, if if you were infected, didn't know it. And I think one of the combina you know one of the insidious things about COVID is that you're infecting people before you show symptoms, so people feel fine. And we're so used to using how we feel as our indicator of level of activity with others. Um, so this context of observation. Yeah, so I just, oh, yeah. Sorry. I just have one response to that, that even though if you have a vaccine that's not preventing you from getting a disease, um, but it's reducing transmission and selling that as like, oh, you're not getting individual protection would be hard. If there's population level protection, you're still getting that individual benefit. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there are still individual benefits because of the population, like it's a feature. No, that's true. That's definitely true. There's an indirect benefit to yourself. Um, and that's always been my concern with some of the kind of anti-vax childhood vaccine discussions. They say it's not much of a problem anymore. But that to me sounds like you're putting the risk on those who did get the vaccine for those who choose not to. You know, you're benefiting from the herd immunity. Um, so there's so yeah, thanks, uh, Cam. That's great, great addition. Um, I was using the word con both filter and context in the sense they're sort of the same thing. Um, with this, the the slide that's up now, the quote from the um, abstract was. An observer imposes a perceptual bias, and that's a filter through which they're observing it. So that's not a critique that that you shouldn't do that. It's just a recognition that that's always there. So being able to document that both for yourself, but also for those reading your work, that you're setting the context and a filter of um, of your uh, of the system you're trying to understand. He takes this further to talk about evolutionary significance because each organism is an observer of the environment and the, re the result of interacting with that environment, observing with that environment um, can impact dispersal, dormancy. Um, likewise, fundamental significance for how we study ecologic systems because the patterns are unique to any range of scales. And so that there's a lot in the abstract to this paper. Some of the content of the um, paper itself may use examples that are dated, but I think there's, I was just struck last year putting this to, these notes together the first time, but how many ideas that are helpful to carry through our work um, on this. Uh, it is, is critical, this idea of scale just permeates everything. So it's a paper I've carried around for a long time because I always thought it was a nice important summary of the idea. So there's the, the side chat on FDA approval is another level of scale. What's, what does it mean to approve a treatment or a vaccination? And what are our standards of evidence? Um, there's the regulatory component and the uh, scientific component and the implementation component. So thanks for all the, the thoughts on these things too. Oh, I'm just putting in spatial filters just to show that uh, that filter idea is really important. I was just to remind myself that I thought it was important too, but I probably thought it was important because I read this paper a long, long time ago. I go, oh, that's like a filter. Um, the key to predicting and understanding lies, it's not predicting and understanding lies, it's the key lies in the elucidation of mechanisms underlying observed patterns. This is the pattern process dichotomy. We, we, we just, it's just, we live in that. We can't not, a pattern doesn't uniquely identify a process and a process may reveal different patterns at different scales. But this is the, this is what we, where we want to be. 
So it can be an uncomfortable sort of theoretical place because it's, it's taking ecology outside of something that can purely be proven in a laboratory, at least to me. Some of my colleagues may disagree with me on that, but they're not in charge today. Um, the mechanisms operate at different scales on which the patterns are observed. So trying to line them up is sort of like focusing a telescope or microscope. And in some cases, patterns must be as understood as emerging from the collective behaviors of larger ensembles of smaller scale units. So this was uh, came up earlier in the chat on emerging patterns. Um, and you can think about what have we learned about COVID-19 over the course of the last year happening at, there are papers at all different scales, there are studies at all different scales, um, and as there's societal implications of things that even happen at the molecular level. So prediction, prediction and estimation is also a tension. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, if you can predict what's going to happen, even though it's not a causal association, you can predict without understanding. That can be, that can be valuable. Uh, say opening and closing schools, if you had a good sense, if you're accurately predicting what happens, that can help. But if you're trying to understand how to intervene at a molecular level or even societal level. Um, so it, I think this is important that predictions better without mechanism might be things like helping know when we need to interact, but they might not tell us how to interact. So also some of our interventions can have effects, um, not because they're causally associated. Social distancing and masks, we tend to think of the causal relations. It's breaking the chain of contact um, and others. Yeah, and COVID taught us that politics can thwart everything, except COVID transmission, thanks. Um, and this com the next comment fits in with these too, uh, that patterns imposed by larger scale constraints. Some of the, pat you know, COVID didn't come in with three waves. Those, we've impacted the imp of COVID with some of our interactions as well. Examination of phenomena. So I basically just cut the, the abstract into all these little pieces, but I feel like in the context of this class, each one of these is something to understand and think about. And this, this uh, comment number nine talks about the emerging things. A lot of what we try to study is how things change as we look at different scales and that helps refine our pictures. And if we don't talk about the scales, we're also kind of hiding some of the reproducibility. So I'd suggest sticking with that. Now, the other paper I put in there is actually a little less interesting, um, but uh, it's a follow-up, you know, years later from 1989 to 2013, uh, this follow-up was, well, what do we know about scale now? Um, and the four revolutions they talk about, some of the big things that have changed at that time, one is what you can do on a computer, the Moore's law about, you know, doubling every, whenever. Computers get faster and faster, data sets get bigger and bigger. There's also been a biochemical, biochemical revolution in terms of PCR sequencing, um, the Chavez paper is in molecular evolution, which started in 1992. Um, there's an environmental sense. We, we can measure a lot of things. We have monitors. Our phones tell Google where we are. We turn it into traffic reports and predictions. Um, and then the information revolution is able to disseminate results on a um, global scale. This is not only the big data revolution, but the scientific publication, like as we saw we have an ability to release results immediately. And some of those can make some big claims, get a lot of coverage without ever going through any kind of peer review. So there's a lot to discuss in this class. Um, I've been talking really fast because in a, if we're in a classroom, I can see a lot of facial expressions and we can speed up and slow down. Um, people can raise their hand to jump in. Thanks for using the chat. Um, but we want to listen actively to the material. Since the class has different speakers, we'll hear about different people giving a you know, one hour version of their work. Keep in mind these ideas at what scale are they observing at? What scale are they making conclusions? What scale do they hope? What is their scale of their question? What's the scale of their data? 
what's the scale of their their answers and what do those answers mean at other scales so i'd encourage you to read actively think actively write actively and suggest um, comments here and um so now i'm going to give you homework that's how we're going to finish today and then todd has an announcement but i'd like you to read these papers you may have already read them once but i would like you to read and think about them read you know read them for parts of them more than once steep in them like a bag of tea and a mug of hot water uh, and interrogate them ask questions to yourself as you read them what do they really mean by this i don't agree with that i do agree with that um, and then take a couple of pages and summarize the key points you see from this interaction with this paper and these concepts we talked about today. And then um, given an ecologic system you've read about or interested in and, ident and list off some of the scales that relate to it. There's no right answer to this, but just start thinking about, oh, I'm interested in influenza, I'm interested in COVID, um, I'm interested in tuberculosis. Here's some scales at which this would be important. And here's where I wanna focus my interest, but I recognize there's other ones. And then you know, read it over. We're going to have you revise this and send it in later in the semester as well. So right now, it's to jot things down from just reading that nothing happens at any single scale. It's all combinations of scale. How does that change what you think about um, your research? And turn that in next week and keep it around because you'll edit it. Um, we'll revisit this throughout the semester. But I think it's more of an exercise of just trying to take the concepts and put them in place. Uh, Todd has a, an announcement to make as well, and then I'll end with my whirling vortex again. So I get it in twice today. Todd, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, yes. So I just wanted to uh, make a couple of announcements. Um, by now, you probably should have received an email um, saying that we have some things going on this semester. We've got the symposium that, that takes place on March 30th. Um, and then also directly following that uh, symposium, we are having a career panel um, with uh, researchers at different points in their uh, career that are going to be talking um, to graduates and undergraduates uh, about career path and career choices. So we'd like to invite all of you um, to participate in, in, in both of those events. There's a registration. Um, that everyone will need to complete to be a part of those events and it's in the email it's also in the signature of any email that i send out um, and then the other exciting thing i have to announce is that we will have the um, rfa for the training program uh, and the award of distinction announced later this week so be on the look for that email great thanks todd thanks everybody i know people have to run to one o'clock um thanks for using the chat I think people run a pool on the side to see how easily distracted I am by the chat, but I hope you find it entertaining. And I think your uh, contributions are really important. Um, that's what the class is about. And um, and Todd gave me a new nickname this week too, so Landwaller. It's short for landscape. Uh, but anyway, good to see everybody. Thanks. Thanks everyone.